So today, you will hear from uh, Joy Aho, Andrea Bradford, Felicia Stanchu, and Amanda, Amanda Connerty. And before we start, a reminder that we will hold questions until the end, and please use the microphone and introduce yourselves prior to asking a question. So without much further ado, I'll pass it on to Joy Aho, and these are our disclosures while she comes up. Hi, everyone. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. This is actually my first Cord Blood Connect, um, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm learning a lot already, just the first day, and I know I'm going to learn even more um, as we get through the next couple days. So um, thank you for um, allowing me to be here. So I'm Joy Aho. I am the Director of Product Management for NMDP Biotherapies, and I think this is probably not news to, this slide's not news to probably 99% of the people in this room, but for that 1% that aren't familiar with NMDP, um, we have been around for over 35 years in facilitating um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, really that first cell therapy. And in particular for this conference, what's really relevant is management of the, uh, the cord blood registry uh, with over 270,000 um, units um, from US banks included in that registry. I'm from NMDP Biotherapy, so we are a wholly owned nonprofit subsidiary of the NMDP that's really focused on taking all of that infrastructure that you see on the slide here that's been built to support transplant and being able to leverage that to help emerging cell therapy developers get their therapies to patients faster. Um, so as part of that, there we go. Uh, we have formed the um, Cord Blood Bank Alliance. So this is a network of cord blood banks that have come together to support emerging cell and gene therapies. They are all existing members of the NMDP network, um, currently just US uh, domestic banks, are all actively collecting, and it is a separate contracted relationship with, um, with NMDP biotherapies versus that relationship to, to support transplant. And all of these partners have a willingness to share um, with their fellow alliance members and biotherapies to move the industry forward. So the idea is that we can work together to really determine what is the best way that we can support the use of cord blood in this emerging industry. So these are all our wonderful partners. There's nine um, cord blood banks currently that are part of this group um, in addition to um, biotherapies. And so the, the group is, is supporting providing these units to um, developers that are developing these therapies. And these are the main products that we're providing through the Alliance today. So we have the cryopreserved non-clinical grade units or the research grade units. Um, these are not going to meet FDA eligibility requirements, but are extremely valuable when you're validating, qualifying, and investigating procedures, processes, assays, and that preclinical and research and development phases. We also have then the cryopreserved clinical grade units. So these are going to meet FDA eligibility requirements. They're fully characterized. We have a extensive data, the type of data that like a beer was able to show we can do that type of analysis on. Um, and they can, they, are, they can both be um, licensed for use for direct transplant or for further manufacturing um, for clinical or commercial use. And then finally, fresh cord blood units, depending on the, the therapy that's being developed. In some cases, they don't want to use a cryopreserved product and require fresh units. So we've been working with the Alliance to um, ideally be able to provide these units as well, both um, units that meet FDA eligibility as well as research, so for further manufacturing. So some of the benefits of the Alliance are having that single point of access to cross-bank inventory um, of these characterized units. And I'll show you some data that, to give you some examples of why you would want to have that cross-bank access. It also um, leverages the strengths of the uh, NMDP biotherapies as well. So as I mentioned earlier, really the goal behind developing NMDP biotherapies was to be able to bring that infrastructure we've developed. And supply chain and logistics coordination and expertise is one of those capabilities that we've developed over that time that we can then bring to be able to manage that piece of the uh, supply chain. 
It can also streamline uh, qualification and audit activities, both for the developers as well as the banks. So ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is the NMDP has qualified all of these banks and performed that, um, that checked that box, um, and we have all of that information, and then the developer can just qualify us in that process, versus the banks then needing to perform an audit with every single developer, and the developer needing to perform an audit of all of those different banks. So the hope is that in the future we can streamline that process. And then finally is the um, bioinformatics um, capabilities that we've developed to be able to look at the types of things that Abir showed earlier and um, analyzing the inventory to be able to look at attributes and usage to maximize how we might be able to leverage some of those underutilized units for various purposes. So to show you some, uh, give you an example um, of some of the benefits of that broad bank access. So in this case, this is just looking at units that are available from the Alliance banks. And if we look at the, that blue bar on the top are the total units that might be available from these banks, or that are available from these banks. And then we can filter by dates of when each individual bank started, um, including commercial consent language within their consents. And when we add that filter, you can see how small that then goes down to the available units that would, that would potentially already have that commercial consent language. And then if we think about things, you know, some of the big areas that we're seeing usage of cord blood units today are for NK cell therapies and IPS cell therapies. So if we look at optimal NK units by just filtering within our um, information that we have for the units that were recently published by um, Katie Rosvani's group out of MD Anderson for those optimal NK units for units that were cryopreserved within 24 hours and had the low nuclear um, red blood cell count, you can see that goes even further down. So these are and the units that also have commercial consent. And then that last bar, the super thin line um, for comparison, this is if you're looking at triple homozygous. So this is an area, if you're um, in the IPS space, there's been a lot of interest in um, getting triple homozygous units to be able to um, enable um, broader population coverage from your banks, the IPS banks. So this, Abir did a great job of explaining this. I am a biologist, not a bioinformaticist. Um, so it's great that she was able to explain it. Um, but the point that I wanted to get across is that what we would love to do then through the Alliance, and, and this also came up um, in questions as well, is be able to take this type of data where we can look at these attributes that, and, and use these algorithms to analyze the inventory of each of the Alliance banks and be able to take that and determine what are the units that are unlikely to be used for transplant that we can repurpose and try to make available for this emerging space um, to be able to allow that use of that really valuable resource. The, um, and, just, and one other thing I think that's really important here is not just using this as we work with the cord blood banks in terms of what units do you want to make available, but also in working with developers. So as you're developing your therapy, we saw a lot of amazing talks about um, expansion capabilities, is designing, um, designing your studies around what is going to be maximally available within the inventory based on you know, some of the things that we can see here, if they're not going to be used in transplant and designing the units that you're going to select for your therapy to maximize availability. So this is a, a similar graph to, um, again, is really to make that point about being able to leverage all of the units that are available today in the inventory. And this is just, again, a test of that algorithm, which um, you're know, looking at so this blue, let's see, there we go. Um, this blue are the units that have shipped and how they scored within the algorithm. So all across and the mean is really at a 25% probability versus the red are the ones that hadn't shipped um, and they're really scoring super low in that algorithm, which is just a, t a test of the algorithm to show that, yes, it's generally performing as expected, um, but just really, provides that point of there's all of these units that have a very low probability of ever being used in transplant, and how can we maximize using them in other cellular therapies? 
So I want to end my discussion with kind of providing three different case studies that we've seen of different examples where we think leveraging the alliance um, can prove very valuable um, if these therapies move forward. Um, and having that combined capabilities of, of all of the amazing banks as well as the capabilities that we've developed at NMDP. So the first one I want to talk about is unit testing and data analysis. So in this case, there are instances where there's additional data that's required on the units to be able to determine if they're going to work in a particular therapy for that manufacturing process. And in this case, that might require genetic testing um, or some other type of testing. And so we were able to leverage capabilities that we've developed at NMDP, where we already had the capability to do a particular testing. We, had quali we can qualify that lab to be able to test material from the cord blood banks, take that data to be able to find rare units. So in this case, the pass rate for these units is around 7%, um, so relatively low and be able to find units then across multiple banks that are participating in that project. We can also then take over time as we're doing that testing to try and take the data that we're generating and utilize the bioinformatics expertise to facilitate additional demographic analysis to continually assess and look for other linked traits or population analysis that might allow us to streamline that testing into the future. The second example is around fresh units. Um, so I mentioned earlier that's one of the things that depending on the therapy, they don't want to use a cryopreserved unit for their process. Um, and so in this case, as you approach later clinical phases or into the commercial space, needing very high volume fresh units that would be available for their therapy. And in that case, working with a single bank or just a couple banks would not fulfill their volume needs. So into the future, as they approach those later phases, would be looking to leverage across multiple banks. So in this case, we can then work with multiple banks to allow to, to get units from many different sources, but then also working with the biotherapies team to develop a consistent shipping um, configuration and process that could be used across the different banks to create some consistency there for the developer. Uh, and then be able to, again, utilize our supply chain and logistics expertise, since in this case it requires an international shipment um, to meet customs and timeline requirements, or even just managing the, the, the supply chain across multiple blanks to be able to streamline that for the developer. And then the, the final example is, um, again, I mentioned the optimal NK cell units. Um, based on that recent publication out of MD Anderson and hi highlighting those attributes. So what we were able to do is based on that publication, go into our inventory, work with, with various banks and analyze their specific inventory for these attributes to identify units and provide that list to the banks. And they can take that list and identify these are the units that we want to make available for that purpose. So we can work across, um, across those banks to have the, the units that can be um, you know, off the shelf available for this particular purpose. And then we've been working through um, the biotherapies group to proactively um, market the availability of these to the industry to make sure that it's clear to the industry that we've got the, you know, all of these units that are going to meet this particular purpose um, for other developers that may be looking to leverage those characteristics. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and thank all of the, the wonderful Corbel banks that are, are part of the alliance and, and have been so wonderful to work with. And, encourage you to um, visit our booth or ask questions if you want more information about the Alliance or our organization. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Andrea Bradford. I'm the Director of Advanced Therapies at Bloodworks Northwest Core Blood Bank, and I've been with the Core Blood Program there since its inception, since um, 1996. Bloodworks Northwest is a independent nonprofit blood bank with over 70 years of history. Our core blood bank um, began allogeneic collections in 1998, and we achieved our FDA license approval um, in 2016. We have six Seattle area collection sites and five in the state of Hawaii through our partnership with the Hawaii Core Blood Bank. Um, we currently have over 15,000 core blood units cryopreserved and listed on the NMDP registry, and to date we have distributed over 1,300 core blood units for transplantation for hematopoietic and immunologic reconstitution. And Bloodworks Northwest mission is saving lives through research, innovation, education, and excellence in blood and medical laboratory services in partnership with our community. So when core blood banking started in the late 1990s, Allogeneic Core Blood Bank started with an intention of collecting and cryopreserving core blood as a new graft source of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells for transplant. Our goals were to create an inventory of ready-to-ship products that immediately were available for patients. When core blood is collected, generally only about 10 to 20 percent of the collections meet the minimum criteria for, to be suitable for banking due to the low volume or cell count. That leaves a large number of fresh core blood units that can be repurposed. And since the beginning, one of our goals was to find an application for every core blood unit so that they are not wasted or discarded. Whether it be for use in QC testing, in process or equipment validations, or sending out to partners, primarily in academic institutions performing non-clinical research. Another original focus of the banks was to recruit core blood donors that would increase the racial and ethnic diversity of the registry so that along with cord blood not having the same strict HLA requirements as other graft sources, this would improve the ability to meet the needs of more patients. So cord blood banks are not all identical. They might be part of a blood bank like we are, or a bigger university system, a larger hospital facility, or be completely independent. We each have different organizational structures that allow us to provide um, all the required operational resources. So standardization of core blood banks is essential, and it's achieved through accreditation um, and FDA licensure. So FACT and ABB provide accreditation for cellular therapy manufacturers that provide standardization of all aspects of core blood at bank operations. The FDA proposed their BLA guidance in 2007, and it was really specific for minimally manipulated, unrelated, allogeneic placental umbilical cord blood intended for hematopoietic and immunologic reconstitution in patients with disorders affecting the hematopoietic system. Very specific. Um, that guidance became effective in 2009, and there are currently eight FDA-licensed U.S. public cord blood banks. So the benefits of accredited and licensed core blood banks is the large number of highly qu high quality systems and infrastructure that are required. Each bank has independent quality programs that oversee all aspects of operations. Quality systems are extensive and include change management, document control, deviation management with corrective and preventative action processes, regulated materials management systems, vendor and supplier qualification programs, chain of identity and chain of custody systems, environmental controls and monitoring. Some have CLIA licensed laboratories that include donor IDM testing using FDA cleared and CMARC tests. And we have established donor recruitment and consent process, hospital collection agreements, trained collectors. We have established courier routes to transport core blood from collection site to manufacturing facilities, as well as established donor screening and qualification processes. So today, as Joy already mentioned and several others, there are currently two, over 270,000 domestic cryopreserved core blood units listed on the NMDP registry. And if a core blood bank is FDA licensed, that does not mean that 100% of their inventory is licensed. Licensure applies only to products manufactured after the date of the core blood bank's approval. That means there's a large inventory of unlicensed core blood units due to them either being manufactured prior to the bank's licensure date or a core blood unit may be unlicensed today due to an issue with donor eligibility, such as a travel risk or a minor process deviation where the product is still deemed suitable for transplantation but did not 100% follow that perfect donor qualification, manufacturing, or testing process required for licensure. 
Most cordblood banks also have an inventory of cryopreserved cordblood units that after cryopres cryopreservation, when some of the subsequent testing or donor for qualification process was performed, they were determined to not be suitable for transplant, but then that cellular material would still be useful for research. And like I previously mentioned, we always try to find an application for the fresh cordblood units that don't meet the criteria for banking as well. And it's, but it's important to understand that that fresh cordblood unit is not a licensed product as licensure applies specifically to cordblood that was cryopreserved. All right, what is involved in cordblood banking? I'm hoping that there's at least one person here who is not already intimately familiar with this information, and maybe you can come and find me later to let me know that I'm not just preaching to the choir. Um, cordblood is collected and processed and tested followed sta following standard operating procedures. Collection is performed using defined materials and supplies by trained staff. There is established transportation with chain of custody from the collection site to the manufacturing facility, either by ground or air transportation. Then upon receipt at the manufacturing facility, a full evaluation of the donor and collection documentation, the consent, packaging and labeling, and accompanying material samples is performed. The core blood unit is assessed and cell counts are performed that include at minimum the nucleated cell viability, and nucleated, and nucleated cell count. Cord blood is then processed to remove the red cells and plasma and the Buffy coat fraction is isolated. The required testing performed on each cord blood unit post-processing pre cryopreservation includes nucleated cell viability, a CBC with differential, um, viable CD34 count, colony forming assay, bacterial and fungal cultures, ABRH testing, HLA typing, and hemoglobinopathy testing. There are minimum counts required by the FDA, but most banks have higher cell count requirements due to the um, likelihood that that core blood unit would be selected for transplant. Core blood units are cryopreserved to a standard volume, usually 25 mils with integrally attached segments, standard labeling, an overwrap is applied, and the core blood unit is placed in an aluminum cassette and control rate frozen and stored in vapor phase liquid nitrogen and monitored freezers. Maternal IDM testing is performed on a sample collected within seven days of the date of collection of the CBU using a standard test panel. The entire batch record documenting all critical steps and testing results are reviewed and approved by technical quality and medical staff for release into inventory. So this is a cryopreserved core blood unit. You can see there's three integrally attached segments on this one. It varies by bank. Um, there's a two compartment bag with a 80-20 fraction, so 20%, or 20 mils in the larger compartment and five mils in the smaller compartment. Um, it has an overwrap and it's stored in an aluminum cassette. The standard patient um, matching process is performed. Um, we perform confirmatory high resolution HLA typing on a segment or another suitable sample, such as a red cell archive, a filter paper, or a spot card. And this testing also serves as the core blood unit identity test. Prior to distribution, a core blood bank will perform release testing on a thawed sample. At minimum, this will include CD34 viability and colony forming assay. Core blood bank will contact the donating mother to confirm the baby's health history, and then a full quality and medical review is re-performed on the collection, transportation, manufacturing test results, and then the final donor eligibility determination is completed. Core blood units are distributed following established shipping procedures, um, including chain of identity and chain of custody documentation, temperature monitoring, standard packaging, accompanying documentation and labeling, and the use of approved couriers. So when a receiving facility um, receives a, a cryopreserved core blood unit, they should have standard operating procedures for receiving, inspecting, and storing cryopreserved core blood units, including inspections and documentation of container integrity, product identity, and temperature verification upon arrival. Facilities should receive information ahead of time in pre preparation for storage and thaw of core blood units. There are different types and sizes of core blood primary containers with different types of ports to access the core blood and different numbers of compartments. A core blood collection may have been cryopreserved in one or two cryo bags and may be RBC depleted or RBC replete. There are different methods to thaw core blood. Core blood units must be thawed following standard operating procedures that reproducibly achieve high cell recovery and maintain high cellular viability and avoid product contamination. 
It's important to establish and follow validated SOPs for thawing and preparation in alignment with the Cordwood Bank's recommendations and tailored to the sales of interest. Cryopreserved Cordwood units should be thawed at 37 degrees Celsius in a validated water bath or a heat bath such as a dry plasma thawer. It's critical to thaw the cordwood unit only to the point of phase change from solid to liquid and not overheat your cells. After thawing, it might be desired to thaw and wash or thaw and dilute the cells depending on your further processes. And usually there's an assessment performed post-thaw of a nucleated cell viability test and an established potency assay based on the cell type of interest. So what are our plans for the future as cordwood banks? I can speak to our bank. We are currently have the same original message and mission to save lives that we started with, and we've shifted our goals from our original banking strategies. We plan to continue to bank core blood units for hematopoietic reconstitution and collect from donors to impact the racial and ethnic diversity of the NMDP registry. However, we're going to try to strategize selection of core blood units added to the inventory with a greater emphasis on diversity high total nucleated cells, and high viable CD34 counts as these units are more likely to be selected for transplant. We would like to increase the utilization of our current core blood inventory to address new applications and indications. And to do that, we need to partner with cell and gene therapy developers to provide cellular material for research or further manufacture. So the benefit of a licensed core blood unit is that it is highly characterized and regulated and produced consistently and manufactured in a quality system. However, that means that there is limited flexibility in the approved manufacturing methods. Removal of samples are limited at certain process points and volumes. Testing is defined. The existing inventory samples are produced that could be used for additional testing, but they are defined and limited. And existing data on each cord blood unit that was collected at the time of manufacturing is defined. And if licensed cord blood units are required, it is important to recognize that there are limitations on requesting changes. We do have the capability of altering a process method to meet a partner's specifications and requirements and perform prospective banking instead of selecting cords from our cryopreserved inventory. However, in this case, the end product, although we are manufacturing following the same GMP standards, it would not be considered a licensed cord blood unit. Changes may require validation as well as SOP and form edits, and they would likely not be feasible for a low number of cord blood units. It would be feasible for a larger number of, or quantity of units are required. Um, it's important to note that sample retrieval can be just as complicated for a core blood bank as a full core blood unit. Um, it can, the verification steps involved include maintaining the product at appropriate temperatures during manipulation, and they're critical and time consuming. And those factors can contribute to the cost involved in those activities. So how do we successfully partner core blood banks and cell and gene therapy developers? It's important to engage as early as possible to determine any restrictions, challenges, or opportunities together. Specifications and requirements need to be determined. Requests need to be evaluated and determined if they're things that are nice to have, or they need to have, or maybe they actually might not be needed at all. If there's additional testing to be performed, we need to identify suitable sample types and determine appropriate facilities to perform the testing. We need to determine if clinical core blood units or research use only units are acceptable for the intended purposes. Then finally, all of this information will go into contracts to determine the terms and responsibilities and costs. Also, documentation will need to be, will need to be provided um, of confirmation of the intended final use of the core blood. All of these discussions to confirm requirements and contracting work usually require several cycles and exchanges of information to flush out all the details and require a lot of back and forth communication. Having the right stakeholders from each party involved in the conversations can greatly improve the timeline to distributing the products. And thank you.
Good afternoon, I'm uh, Felician Stencio from uh, Bucharest, Romania. I want to start by thanking God for this wonderful day, thanking the organizers for having me here and also for you participating in this. For the past few years we did a clinical study in which we administered cold blood to autistic uh, kids and um, we'll try to present the results of this uh, study beginning with um, presenting the factors associated with uh, ASD. And uh, we know there is a great variety of uh, causal factors, um, and there are shown to be around uh, 800 uh, altered genes, which uh, to some degree influence the um, development and uh, symptoms of uh, ASD. And uh, mostly they um, are uh, showing into uh, altered balance of uh, excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters and um, also uh, modifications of the immune system which is in uh, about one-third of the cases uh, located uh, to the uh, gastrointestinal system and um, also there were evidentiated some modification on uh, a functional MRI showing that uh, some uh, neural tracts are altered. We tried to um, group these factors into uh, intrinsic and extrinsic to the central nervous system. And um, many times there is a uh, dysfunction of uh, microglia, which is in turn uh, influenced by the activity of uh, astrocytes, uh, but uh, also on uh, uh, ad adenosine receptors. Um, trying to make things more uh, simple, um, we're trying to point uh, towards the main modification seen in uh, most patients and uh, it is demonstrated there is increased inflammation and uh, oxidative stress uh, in a majority of uh, cases. Also in uh, post-mortem studies and also on uh, functional MRI it is in uh, increased synapse formation in about 60% of uh, cases. But also, uh, and here we have our contribution, um, we have seen increased uh, neuronal apoptosis uh, at uh, post-mortem studies and uh, in uh, some clinical studies. Uh, putting this together, uh, we are saying that uh, two important molecules uh, are the NFK uh, kappa uh, beta, which is involved in both inflammation, but also in uh, uh, synapse formation and uh, learning and memory. So this is uh, probably one of the important molecules which is uh, uh, altered in uh, ASD. Also the mTOR is uh, involved in uh, pruning of neural synapses and this was shown to be defective. Um, some reasons for cell therapy using SD. Um, we're trying to modify the immune system to modulate its activity and uh, lower the inflammation, and especially the neuroinflammation. And uh, this is done uh, by uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, paracrine uh, action involved here. Uh, also the stem cells from core blood uh, can generate new neurons um, and uh, we have seen in some studies the CNS implantation post-administration is possible and uh, uh, even though the mesenchymal stem cells are mesodermal derived and uh, Neuronal, neurons are ectodermal. Um, we have seen differentiation of uh, uh, MSCs into neuronal pre precursors, uh, even from adipose derived MMCs. And uh, there is a picture of uh, the Cressil violet uh, stain on uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, fibroblasts, which uh, in culture differentiated into. Uh, neuronal precursors. Um, probably the best known uh, studies are uh, I'm involving uh, stem cells in ISD are those of uh, Professor Kurzberg and Duke University, which I'm sure that you know. And uh, 
there was an interesting thing I came across uh, recently, wondering about uh, factors uh, influencing the success of the core blood administration in such situations. Um, there was a very interesting answer involving uh, the monocytes from core blood, the CD14, uh, and uh, two uh, studies by uh, Saha, I think is the pronunciation, uh, showing that uh, the core blood monocytes are able to um, rescue brain cells from uh, hypoxic uh, ischemic injury, but uh, not uh, adult uh, monocytes. So this is a very interesting uh, path to follow, and uh, we'll try to investigate this uh, in a future study. Um, put it um, shortly, um, stem cells are not uh, currently recommended for standard clinical use, and uh, this has multiple explanations, starting with the uh, paucity of uh, clinical trials, uh, which can validate this utilization. And uh, we're trying to uh, be more um, thorough in investigating this uh, uh, therapeutic, therapeutic possibility. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we can probably um, improve on is the statistical um, interpretation, the conception of uh, clinical trials, because uh, anybody who work with the as the kids, uh, besides knowing the great difference, basically it's difficult to see uh, two kids while altered in the same way. So there's a great variety in uh, the pathology itself, but also there are differences be uh, in the uh, administered therapy. Um, autologous core blood has important uh, differences which uh, are very difficult to take into consideration properly in a clinical study. So um, doing the, the proper setup for the clinical trial is important. And uh, it's worth mentioning here the fact that uh, some kids are having impressive responses. Uh, there are transformative modifications, transformative progresses in uh, some kids, while others have no such progress. So it's important to um, try to investigate the causes of uh, these differences, and uh, this will help uh, everybody, including us. Um, we should be able to be more precise when uh, uh, indicating such uh, treatment. On a bigger picture, there were uh, two recent meta-analyses, and um, they included a few hundred patients. I want to point out here that um, while using different evaluation scales, the statistical significance of the progress was different. See on the second meta-analysis, when uh, it was considered the ABC scale um, and the CARS scale, there was a significant difference, statistically significant difference, while the uh, VABS scale, there was no statistical significance. Uh, talking uh, about the ways to predict the efficacy of uh, core blood in ASD, uh, <clears throat> there was the experience from Duke, and uh, it was shown that uh, the ASD severity is uh, an important such criterion, and uh, uh, before administering the treatment, the uh, beta power and uh, especially the baseline posterior beta power on uh, electroencephalogram uh, was associated with a greater degree of uh, improvement in specific areas. Um, so we have uh, some markers which are um, related to the patient assessment before the treatment as this severity is uh, the most important one probably. There are also inflammation markers and uh, trying to point out if inflammation is intrinsic of, or extrinsic to the central nervous system. 
And uh, we also looked after uh, oxidative stress markers and some uh, metabolic markers. On the other side, the uh, umbilical cord blood markers, uh, important as uh, uh, it was mentioned before, the monocyte content, which nobody measured so far, and unfortunately we didn't uh, do that either. But uh, a 2010 study from Germany um, showed that uh, the ratio of uh, mesenchymal versus uh, hematopoietic stem cells uh, does affect the site of implantation, such as when this ratio is one to one, the mesenchymal stem cells tend to implant um, preferably in uh, the CNS, while uh, a higher ratio, is many more uh, mesenchymal versus hematopoietic, uh, result in uh, implantation preferentially in the lung. So controlling this ratio may give uh, uh, <coughs> better result. We did flow cytometry and uh, looked into it, and we'll show this a little later. Uh, another uh, uh, possibility of the difference in the efficacy of the core blood uh, can be explained by the differential uh, presence of embryonic cell markers, such as NANOG and OCT. And um, one uh, global evaluation of UCB can be seen or given by a microRNA profile, which we didn't do yet, but we plan to do it in uh, further study. There are uh, other cell surface markers which may be involved and may be useful, uh, 246, 283. And uh, with all this uh, introduction, it's time to move on to the actual study. It was uh, thought as a crossover study, and uh, we have administered sequentially specific supplements based on the blood test and also, of course, the core blood. And uh, inclusion cr criteria, body weight 15 to 30 kilos and uh, age three to seven years. And um, the children should have received prior, uh, more multiple treatments with uh, not much improvement. Um, we didn't uh, accept uh, children with inborn error of metabolism or major genetic pathologies. We accepted the uh, single um, nucleotide polymorphism, but uh, not uh, uh, copy number variations, uh, especially those involving tens of genes. The population um, was mostly from Romania, and we had uh, 42 uh, Romanians and uh, two mixed nationals uh, and 12 international patients from Israel, Portugal, Poland, Slovakia, and one from the United States. We evaluated uh, 74 uh, uh, ASD kids, and uh, we administered uh, 56 uh, um, patients. Uh, we administered uh, umbilical cord blood in 56 patients. Youngest was uh, two years uh, and eight months, and the oldest was uh, 13 years. Uh, this because we made some exceptions to the inclusion criteria in order to have uh, a larger number of uh, children and be able to uh, better evaluate predictive uh, markers for efficacy. However, um, in the final analysis, we only uh, looked into the 28 kids uh, who respected the inclusion criteria. And uh, we only uh, did uh, um, raw statistical analysis for the blood test for all of uh, uh, participants. Now, the blood test that we did was, of course, the blood typing, the identification the, um, of uh, the core blood. And um, we did three sets of blood tests before and after each of the two treat treatments. And this involved the CBC with differential um, set of inflammation markers, including ESR, CRP, TNF-alpha, ferritin, alpha-2 globulins, and uh, liver function test, renal function, electrolytes, and uh, 
a panel of uh, nine anti-neuronal antibodies, uh, in some kids homocysteine, and uh, also in selected kids uh, extra blood tests, uh, which were will be summarized a little later. What we did uh, um, more uh, unusual was the level of uh, neuron-specific enolase uh, in a clinical laboratory. And uh, here we have to say that uh, NSC was shown to be comparatively elevated in ASD kids com compared to neurotypical, but um, it was not um, pathologically elevated, the mean level was about uh, 2.8 uh, nanograms per ml, and in our study, most of the kids had uh, abnormally elevated NSC levels above 17, which is considered uh, pathological. And we got some uh, pretty scared calls from uh, the parents because when they get the results from the clinical lab, they look up the NSC and they see the association with uh, uh, neuroblastoma and uh, uh, lung cancer. So we had to uh, reassure them that was not the case. Um, there is an observation here on the um, banal testing of uh, blood uh, antigens, blood group back antigens. When considering strictly the Romanian children and uh, comparing the frequency of ASD kids, 100% Romanian, with uh, studies uh, showing the distribution, the frequency of such an antigens in general population, we have seen a significant difference in the presence of uh, A, B group antigens. So, there is a uh, tendency that uh, the blood antigens are more present. The lack of antigens is uh, less frequent in SD kids, and we've seen this also in the RH uh, antigen. Comparing the frequency of AJLA uh, alleles, also strictly for the Romanian populations, and uh, comparing them to their frequency in the general Romanian population, we have only seen uh, a statistically significant difference in the DRB116, uh, which was uh, higher in frequency. However, um, there is a suspicion this is not an uh, uh, important finding because uh, we have seen uh, brothers with uh, this um, configuration, uh, and one of the brothers didn't have uh, ASD. Now going to the blood test results that uh, were mentioned before. Um, we have seen in uh, more than three quarters of uh, patients elevated markers of inflammation, starting with the ESR and um, also the CRP, which was uh, in abnormal in about 30% of patients, and uh, TNF-alpha, close to 70%. And uh, in a similar percentage, the alpha-2 globulins on the protein electrophoresis. Now, it's much cheaper to do the protein electrophoresis than TNF-alpha on a clinical level. But the big surprise was uh, the uh, presence of the NSC elevated abnormally elevated NNC in uh, uh, essentially all the ASD patients. And uh, this is an uh, important finding that uh, we want to further study. Um, in a much less uh, percentage of patients, we have seen uh, variations in uh, um, sodium levels, and there is a study uh, uh, which showed that uh, the sodium transporter was uh, altered in uh, some of the SD kids and the uh, administration of certain uh, diuretic improved the ASD symptoms. So it's possibly linked to that. Um, homocysteine was uh, lower than normal in uh, four patients and uh, in one was higher. 
And another special case was the ferritin, which was lower than normal in 10 patients, but uh, higher in uh, four patients. So this again shows the big variability of uh, the presentations and the uh, factors involved. Um, we tried to see some correlations between uh, various blood tests and uh, we've seen that just in four patients out of uh, 55 uh, there were no uh, such markers present. And uh, in flow cytometry we mentioned the uh, CD133 versus uh, 271. Unfortunately we didn't see a significant uh, correlation with the psychometric uh, blood test. And talking about this, um, there were scores uh, for each patient, and uh, the result was that uh, in about two-thirds of the patients there was a clear improvement uh, noted uh, by the psychotherapist doing the evaluations, also the therapists uh, who uh, took care of the ch child before and after. Um, on the lower side, uh, we have seen that uh, the improvement uh, in psychometric scoring was inversely correlated with the inflammatory markers and uh, uh, positively correlated with the NSE levels. And uh, here we have uh, some statistically significant difference between uh, initial and final scores. Uh, there was improvement in uh, hyperactive, uh, stereotypical behavior, um, uh, inadequate verbalization, and uh, there's an interesting here, uh, thing here. Um, it was difficult to quantitate those modifications. And uh, here there are some statements from uh, parents and therapists uh, during the interview with the psychotherapists. And uh, they are pretty different from the quantitative uh, score that uh, was given by the uh, evaluations. And, uh, um, we have some pretty happy uh, situations. Um, uh, some three kids actually started to speak. Um, there were um, happy families and uh, this was uh, extra reason for us to try to see what are the factors which are affecting uh, the results. Uh, in short, the messages uh, are that uh, inflammation and uh, neuronal destructions were present in most children, and uh, these are addressed by both uh, hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal from UCB. Uh, interestingly, high initial levels of inflammation and high ferritin were associated with uh, no improvement or very little improvement on UCB, and this can be uh, considered as a predictive factor. Um, as we said, uh, about 10% of children showed ample, even transformative progress. Uh, again, about uh, you know, one third did not show big progress. And uh, in the future, we're trying to um, explore the underlying uh, ASD pathology, uh, as well as uh, individual characteristics of the uh, umbilical cord blood in order to better be able to um, predict the efficacy. I want to thank to uh, Famicore Group and to Ola, and this is the team um, who effect effectively um, did the clinical study, and I want to thank them and uh, also you for attention, and uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I think that uh, the current situation of uh, harvesting core blood is not uh, a a good one, uh, and I think that uh, we should let the parents decide what they want to do with uh, their own cells and tissues. So there should be, during the prenatal visits, such a discussion with the obstetrician, and there should be an informed consent which clearly states if the family wants to throw it away, donate it to public, or use it for family. And, uh, of course, there should be clear discussion about normal versus delay core blood clamping, uh, cord uh, clamping, and also um, the possible uses. This is uh, probably the end of it. Thank you for attention and uh, waiting for your questions.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm the only thing standing between you and the closing remarks and a reception, so I appreciate that everyone stayed for this last talk. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the needs of cord blood developers, or developers of cord blood therapy, so I'm speaking from an industry perspective. Um, my disclosure is that I am a developer, so I work uh, at Arteva Biotherapeutics, so that's my disclosure. So the topics I'm gonna uh, be talking about today, just sources of donor material in general, which I'm sure most of you are already aware of, um, how the vendors can support us as developers as far as screening and collection, and then how can we work together in this novel space to benefit both organizations. So for sources of cellular material, um, I think you're all aware, aware there are autologous and allogeneic cells. Autologous, obviously, related to you. It's your own cells that you've donated. It could be your own cord blood. It could be your own peripheral blood, your own bone marrow. Um, allogeneic is for someone who's similar, but not you. Um, and then umbilical cord and peripheral blood. I'm just going to cover those today. Um, this is a, an umbilical cord conference, so most of my talk is going to be about that. As far as what goes into a leukapheresis, peripheral blood donation and collection, obviously there's some eligibility and screening that goes into the donor. There's the actual leukapheresis procedure, so they're gonna go into the collection center, have the apheresis. Um, it's very similar to donating blood or plasma, but usually takes about three to five hours. Um, the blood goes into a leukapheresis machine, which separates it into all the components, including stem cells or white blood cells. Um, the plasma and platelets go back to the patient, the white cells stay into a separate bag, and then those go off to a facility or a lab for processing and then ship off to whoever needs it, to a transplant lab, to a developer, or frozen down for later. Um, there are a few, you know, centers around the country that do this commercially. A lot of academic centers and blood centers do this for their own use or for uh, other customers as well. Um, you know, as a developer, I have the opportunity, I can contract directly with one of these vendors or with a blood bank, or I can work with, you know, a, a vendor like Be The Match to sort of broker that for me. Um, there's both GMP and research grade available in the leukapheresis market. As cell therapy has started to advance, a lot of these companies are now offering GMP grade um, collected products, which is interesting from a cell therapy perspective. From cord blood donation and collection, I'm sure most people here are familiar with this, I'll just lightly cover it. Um, there are enrollment forms, like he just mentioned, you know, it's obviously about consenting from the family. They want to consent to either bank this for themselves, for their family, or donate it to a public bank. There's a lot of medical history and consent forms, questions about their lifestyle and any risk factors. Obviously, the informed consent is the important part. Um, they have to consent, obviously, for the donation and understand that it's gonna be used publicly if it is for public donation. Once the baby's born, there's a process to collect that cord blood in a collection bag, and then it's sent off to the lab for processing. As testing, I think we've covered the testing of everything that goes into a cord blood test. Um, I won't go into that. But, uh, the, you know, again, cord blood's processed, all the red cell plasmas are removed, and then the, it's frozen down into a very small amount, you know, 25 mils, and then typically frozen uh, for long-term storage, and then it can be used for transplant or for things like what I'm working on. Um, I think there's some new options now for some fresh cord blood where people need that. A little trickier from a development perspective, but it can be done. And then once those are frozen down, they're all into the registry and available to be searched across all of the banks that are in the networks. As far as demographics, based on what search you look at, there are around uh, 20 to 25 public cord blood banks in the U.S. Um, most of these units are on registries like NMDP, um, and they're accessible to patients in the U.S. and ac across the globe. Again, I can work directly with these banks, or I can work with Be The Match or with other vendors that broker these cord blood units. As far as banks around the globe, again, depending on your source, there's around 150 to 170 public cord blood banks. Um, these can be found on registries like WMDA, which we've heard from today, Anthony Nolan, NetCord, and a few others. So how can vendors of cord blood support developers like me? Um, I think one of the big things, and this has kind of been covered from some of my colleagues today, is establishing a good donor pool. How many donors are in your network? Um, you know, depending on the screening process for an individual developer, it may be quite complicated, it may be nothing. 
Um, but you know, we, you may have to screen 10 or 20 donors in order to find the one that works for their process. And so having a great pool of donors is very helpful for developers. Um, as far as you know, recruitment initiatives, how many new donors are added to your pool every month, every quarter, every year? If I'm going through 10 or 20 donors a month to find the one, but you're not adding any new ones, eventually you're gonna, I'm gonna tap out your uh, donor pool, so that wouldn't be helpful for either of us. Um, as far as the donors that you have in your pool, are they available to donate for any study or product? You know, one of the things we've talked about today is consent and that timeline for commercial consent. That's sort of a new concept in cell therapy, right? You know, historically, cells that have been donated for cord blood or people donating in peripheral blood, it's mostly been for transplant. So as we get into this new arena of emerging cell therapies, commercial use is a new topic of conversation. And so for someone like me, it's very important. It's 100% required that the cells are consented for commercial use. Even though I'm you know, years away from a commercial product, I can't be for sure that what I'm developing today may not be used in a commercial product later. And then if you've got you know, cells or donors in your pool that have not been consented for commercial, is it possible that you could reconsent them? That would be something that would also work. Um, how reliable are your donors? Obviously for cord blood, the material is largely banked already, and so it's already there. You don't have to worry about their reliability as a donating infant, but um, for peripheral blood, it's great to screen a donor and find that this is what I want for my process, and then they not show up for the collection. So having reliable donors, very important. And again, it came up earlier, how diverse is your donor pool? Um, as far as age, gender, ethnicity, and then what data do you already have on your pool? Like I said, sometimes, you know, the screening criteria are very easy and straightforward and are things you already have in your database, and sometimes they're a little more um, intricate. As far as donor screening capabilities, obviously some basics, you know, are you following FDA guidelines on all the screening, infectious diseases, eligibility, if that's applicable to the process. Um, what in-house testing do you have available? Can you do additional HLA or flow markers or cell counting on any of your banked material? And if not, do you have a vendor that you can use to outsource that? And if you don't have a vendor, can you work with the sponsor's vendor? Um, you know, a lot of developers have vendors that they work with, they've been working with on the research side, and if you don't have that established relationship with a third party, it would be great if you could use the vendor's uh, testing lab. And then for all the tests that are required, what is the turnaround time for these screening tests? And that may depend as if it's in-house, if it's your vendor, if it's the third party vendor. Um, and then are you willing to accommodate testing that you don't typically do on your donors? Uh, for for you know, these crazy cell therapies that are coming out now that aren't necessarily transplant related, there's a lot of interesting tests that are not typical of transplant testing. And are you willing to perform those tests or have them performed? Um, how many donors can you screen at a time? Um, you know, she mentioned earlier that pulling out a segment is just as hard as pulling out the unit. I absolutely appreciate that. So anytime I'm working with any cord blood or donor suppliers, I just ask them, what can you do? I'm not gonna dictate, I need you to screen 20 at a time because I appreciate that you've got staff digging around in freezers to pull out segments and that's very tedious. Um, can you perform tests on the donors only or also on collected product? You know, obviously for cord blood, there is a limit on segments, and I realize those are precious from the transplant setting, and for me, not working in that space now, I don't want to take away from anyone's transplant, and so I'm, you know, cautious of how much material is available to be tested. Um, you, there's also some benefits and challenges of screening donors up front. Um, from my perspective, it's a bit of a risk mitigation. You know, screening the donors before allows me to weed out, you know, potential donors that won't work in my manufacturing process or that they don't meet the required criteria. Um, it's also very efficient. So what it allows me to do is screen donors and then only purchase or acquire donors that meet my criteria ahead of time and then bank those into my own inventory. It helps me plan my manufacturing and it helps select you know, the most appropriate donors based on their therapeutic requirements. There's also some regulatory compliance that could be involved. Um, it ensures that the selection process does comply with whatever regulatory guidelines and ethical considerations are there. Typically for transplant, those are pretty well spelled out in the CFRs, but for cell therapies, like what I'm uh, developing, some of the regulatory nuances that are coming out are different and new and changing every day, and so being flexible with that is always important. 
some of the challenges with upfront screening delays, obviously, you know, when we're screening donors and waiting for test results. Um, it, it's great for someone like me where I'm building up an inventory of do starting donor material, but obviously in a transplant setting or if you're working with a product for urgent medical need where it's an, you know, a single donor to a single patient, uh, screening upfront may not be the best way to do it. Also resource allocation, like we mentioned. Um, you know, wasting time screening 20 donors, finding out none of them are willing to actually donate is very frustrating. And then sometimes there's just not enough material available from either banked units or donors to do the proper screening or testing that may be required based on someone's manufacturing process. As far as establishing, you know, a donor and product collection and distribution logistics, one of the questions we always ask is once we find a donor or find a unit, what's the turnaround, turnaround time to actually collect that or get that shipped to me? Um, it's very important to have all of these things outlined in whatever agreement you come up with f with the manufacturer or with the developer that you're working with. Um, it definitely helps with planning and scheduling on my end. It probably helps with planning and scheduling on your end so you know what you're up against. You know, hey, in the next six months, I'm gonna need to screen 50 units to help out this developer so I can find five that work in their manufacturing process. And it really does facilitate the overall development and manufacturing timelines on my end. Um, you know, if the developer were to require additional manipulation of the material product to shipment, can you do that? Can you perform that manipulation? And just be honest, if there's things you can and can't do, just state that and make, make it clear up front. I put in here, don't be a hero. Um, I think sometimes some providers are a little overzealous, like, yes, I can do whatever you want. And then um, that may not be true. They may think they can, and then next thing you know, like, well, this happened, and then I'm like, okay, you know, it's fine. I appreciate the enthusiasm, but at the same time, just we'll, we'll work it out. You don't have to, to make up anything. So, um, and then again, on banked material, what's the turnaround time from screening to unit shipment to the developer? Do you guys have a vendor that you use for shipping? A lot of people already do, but if you don't, do you want to use the developer's um, vendor? All of the costs obviously need to be outlined in the agreement. Um, as far as my end, we can and we will be flexible and accommodating because we appreciate what you all go to through build up your donor material, build up your cord blood banks, and so we really do want to work with you and be flexible. Again, flexibility, I've put that here many times and said it many times. Um, we really need you to work with us on all the contracts and agreements and budgeting and testing and again, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I definitely appreciate what goes into all those things. I also appreciate, hey, maybe you can't do a CD3 as much as I'd like to, you to on a segment. Um, that's a pull for any future testing. Can you do a CD3 on a segment? Um, <laughs> uh, working with our schedules, you know, I know you guys do too, but in the biotech world, especially when you're a small company, we're all working, you know, 40 hours a day and uh, that sort of thing. So it's, we're all working on crazy timelines and things and we appreciate that you are too. Um, and we also know that what we're asking you to do is very time consuming. It's outside of your normal workflow. It's outside of things you've been doing for 20 years and we appreciate that. Um, and so again, I always try to be flexible. Hopefully your other uh, customers do as well. And I think listen to our requests. And I, I mean, like I said, I mean really listen. I really do mean that. Um, I think don't just say no because you haven't done it before. Again, cell therapy is changing every day and people are gonna come to you with what you think are crazy requests or crazy requests for testing or crazy requests for processing and your initial response may be like, oh, of course, no way, please leave. But um, then maybe think about it for five minutes and say, well, well, maybe, you know, and I appreciate too, like ends of one when a customer comes to you and says, hey, I need two units in the next five years and I need them to be this crazy processing, obviously feel free to say no because, you know, you can't do that, so. Um, but be open to new ideas, new ways of doing things. Um, again, we're asking you to use your products in ways they've never been used before. Um, we're asking you to screen for things you've never screened before, and you may, I may come to you with like, hey, can you do this? And you're gonna be like, why would you ever wanna do that? I do have a reason, um, as crazy as it may seem. Um, and then, you know, work with us where you can on solutions to any roadblocks. Um, I think, you know, everyone's an expert at what they do, and so working together makes a bigger field of experts, and so it's really great to get a, a group of minds together to come up with solutions to problems. And then, if you can work directly with us, that's always great. I like working directly with vendors, but I appreciate sometimes it's too complicated, and if you want to go through a larger network um, as, like, a facilitator to do that, I'm fine to do that, too. 
like I said, I appreciate everyone's busy, everyone's, you know, got their normal day jobs, and so crazy people like me coming to you with weird requests, I understand, like, you're like, eh, I don't have time to deal with you today, so, uh, but, you know, if you can make the time, that would, that would be great. Um, let's see here. So what else can you do for us? Um, communication, there's never too much communication. Obviously be honest about what you need from us. Um, don't be shy to just say, hey, this is what I need in order to get this done for you because nine times out of 10, 99, you know, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, we're gonna do what you need us to do because we need you, we really do. We can't do it without you. Um, let us know how we can help you. If we have a vendor that you've never used, we can facilitate that. I've done that many times um, to help get vendors set up that you know, a, a particular cord blood bank didn't work with previously. Um, again, use us as a resource. Um, we want to work with you. Yeah, like I said, we understand this is new, and, uh, but we can be flexible. Um, we want to use your products. Like I said, I don't have a cord blood bank, but I need the cord blood for what I'm making, so when I say I need you, I, I really mean it. Um, and we also appreciate, I do appreciate you're running a business. You know, I'm quasi running, trying to run a business, but you guys are running a business too, and you have day-to-day -day tasks and goals to meet. Um, and then we want this to be a partnership. Um, partnering with the banks, I think it, it just steers the, the community as a whole in the right direction. And as a group, I think we'll get there quicker and better if we all work together. And like I said, we cannot do this without you. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank each of the speakers for very insightful presentations about cord blood banking, distribution, utilization, clinical trials. At this time, we'll take questions. And I can start. Uh, this is for Amanda and Andrea. So it feels like sometimes, especially in the adult, adult but now also the cord, cord blood world, you get people who have requests that seem more superstition than science. And so, you know, I need a donor with blue socks collected at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, and we know that works, but we can't say why. Um, and the same goes for cord blood. Uh, we get a lot of requests for specifications where there isn't basic science published. So how, as cord blood bankers and industry providers, do we provide material that supports scientifically unsupported or not yet published uh, qualifications for units? Okay, very good question. I too am a fan of science. Um, that is a challenge. And I'll say like just being out, you know, at conferences and things and um, listening to some of my colleagues in the fields, um, blue sock requests, I'm, I'm just kind of sitting there looking at them like, wow. Um, it, it's hard even when I'm just sitting in the back of the room. And so, I mean, you can always ask for a rationale. I mean, ask, ask why. I think that's appropriate. You know, as far as the screening that I use, it's very simple, and I'll talk about that later in the, uh, in the weekend. But, um, yeah, I think it's within your right because it does take a lot of process, time, money, effort on your part to set up this testing needs vendors. And I think it's within your right to say, can you just tell me, you know, why you're looking at this? Um, you know, what, what is the important part of that? Because some, some of the requests are interesting. And Andrea, can you comment on why some of these things are not possible and how that impacts the conversation with developers? Um, yeah, so basically we get a lot of wild requests, right? So that was my um, comment on the, is this really a nice to have, need to have, tell me more about it. So it's more about having that conversation about diving more deeply into the asks and trying to figure out what the rationale is. Um, we obviously still always have to work within our frameworks, our consents, our regulatory and standards are very important, so we always require vetting. Um, like you mentioned in the beginning, um, it is really hard to provide cellular material to people who don't have published research. So we need some kind of like an IRB, an IND, something to guarantee that the cells are being used for the right intended use. So we have a form that we have um, potential people, partners, fill out, just so that we can ensure that the cord blood is being used for the right purposes. What was the second part of your question about being a difficult, right? 
difficult because we have to always maintain, like, like work within our framework. Right. So some, but also teaching, right? Giving away too much information. So if if I ask for a baby's date of birth, oh birth right, weight, so yes, time, yes, gender, yes. So we always have to make sure we're maintaining confidentiality, um, not providing PHI, things like that. Absolutely. Great session, thank you very much. Um, I guess maybe this is, well, it's for all of you potentially, but Joy, um, I think, you know, as a, someone who's developing cord blood therapies as well, outside of transplant, it is amazing to me how many misconceptions, um, and Amanda, you might have this experience as well, about what cord blood actually is. Um, it's actually quite shocking how many people don't know when you say cord blood, and then I realize I didn't say umbilical, and they have no clue, right, what we're talking about. And then there's a lot of back and forth about, well, it's too small, it's too, well, and I think we'll talk about some of this stuff tomorrow, but it's too small, it's too fill in the blank to be used, it's too expensive, it's too this, it's too that. Um, but actually, I think it's the best source <laughs> of cells to be used for pretty much anything, and I think enabling developers and educating people who are starting to think about cellular immunotherapies and that cord blood is available is really important to the space. Um, like Amanda said, that slide you had, we need you. We do, we do need the banks and we need to ensure that they stay alive. So I guess my question after all of that rambling is, like what is biotherapies, NMDP biotherapies, or all of you doing to try to educate the space industry about the use of cord blood and what a valuable resource it is. And as Joanne always says, it's not just a bag of stem cells, there are other cells in there. So how are we getting this out there? Because it truly, truly is astounding how few people know what a great source it is. In the beginning, I thought that was great because then there's more for me, but really now we need to think about the sustainability. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I don't know that we've come up with a magical answer. I mean, we are, we are trying, you know, different things like having webinars that talk about where, you know, we have different banks that join us to talk about what they're doing and the value of cord blood and why the cells in it are special and different. Um, so that's one mechanism, you know, attending conferences to try and like, you know, have that conversation. And even the folks that we talk to, because we also provide adult, adult donor starting material um, but having that like conversation, have you thought about cord? You know, as, as they're asking different questions. Um, I think the one challenge that we have that we, we still need to try and overcome is a lot of times by the time we're having that conversation, they've already made some of those decisions. And so trying to figure out the best way to get ahead of it, um, because a lot of that's gonna be probably even like more academic or, you know, before it gets to when they, when they want to come to us. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a great answer, but it's something that's definitely top of mind of like how can we start influencing earlier? Okay, if there aren't any more questions, we're a little ahead of schedule. I will turn it over to Colleen for the end of day announcements.